Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Marianne Walk. Marianne, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Marianne, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? Hey, I am at the Idaho National Laboratory, INL, and I am the Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology and Chief Research Officer. Marianne, how long have you been in that role, and what are some of your major roles and responsibilities at INL? Sure. I've been here for almost three and a half years. I started in January of 2019, and my roles are, to, I am one of two deputy lab, lab directors, along with the lab director, we run the laboratory, so we have that internal role of organizational things. And in fact, today we announced an organizational change, which was, those things are always fun. Um, I also run our internal research and development program, which we call Laboratory Directed Research and Development. I run our program with the DOE Office of Science at the laboratory. As you know, DOE Office of Science is a $7 billion a year organization that funds a great variety of things including some things at INL. And I am responsible for our labor overall laboratory technical strategy and for documenting that in our annual laboratory plan, which we have to submit to DOE, which just went in April this year. And then we'll be presenting it with DOE. And I represent the laboratory in a variety of functions. So I'll in both internally and in the community and also in the National Laboratory community. So I'm a member of the National Laboratory Chief Research Officers Group. I'm a former chair of that group in 2020, I was the chair. And so I have a variety of things that I do sort of on an ad hoc basis across the entire National Laboratory system with the Chief Research Officers. So most national laboratories have a director who is of course in charge of the whole laboratory. And our laboratory is about 5,400 employees right now. And I believe we are the fifth largest from a employee perspective. There are 17 labs. And, uh, and most labs also have a deputy for management and a deputy for research. So that's, that's how I fit in. Marianne, what are some of the most exciting science and technology endeavors happening at INL these days? Well, we, have, we actually have, a, I think, a pretty good range of things that we do at Idaho National Laboratory. We don't do everything. We're relatively well focused for a national laboratory. We are an applied energy national laboratory. There are, are three of those. So INL for nuclear. So we're sponsored by the Office of Nuclear Energy and DOE. There's also National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL, which does uh, renewable technologies such as wind solar. And then the NETL, National Energy Technology Lab, which does uh, fossil primarily, and now is focusing on carbon capture and sequestration with fossils, a clean potential clean energy source. So we have three applied energy labs, we've got 10 Office of Science labs, and then we've got um, three national security labs and one uh, focused on environmental management, which is Savannah River. So we fit into the ecosystem in the more applied energy area, focusing on nuclear, but we also focus on uh, integrating nuclear and other applied other energy technologies into things we're calling integrated energy systems right now that can produce both heat and electricity at the same time or orchestrated such that we could uh, have a very flexible energy supply for both electricity and creating chemicals, desalinating water, all those types of things all within a geographical area. So that's, that's a focus that we have. I think that's very exciting because it's the type of thing we need to do for the future clean energy system to be able to be meet flexibility demands and keep use our resources appropriately. Right now, nuclear energy is usually produced by very large light water reactor plants that are on the order of a gigawatt each. They're not very flexible. They're great for baseload power, but they're it's difficult to turn them on and off quickly. We use natural gas for that in this country, natural gas peaking plants. So we need clean ways to peak power and then also to 
use, we throw away a lot of energy through thermal heat. Mm -hmm. And so how can we use that? So that's sort of thing, you know, big picture types of things we're trying to think about. From a nuclear perspective, the laboratory is focused on advanced nuclear technologies. Right now we are looking mostly at smaller reactors. These are small light water reactors, which are technologically similar to what we do with the big ones, or else micro reactors or others and some other small modular reactor technologies that are not light water. So they use different types of fuels, but they have advantages in terms of inherent safety characteristics are much less complex. They typically do not operate at high pressures like light water reactors do. And they are have longer fuel cycles so that you can have a, you do not need to refuel the reactor so, so frequently. The big plants we use now have to be shut down every 18 months to two years to be refueled. So there are, re and, then, and then the smaller ones give you some flexibility in terms of potentially using them for load following, but also uh, for different applications like remote, remote cities or a big mine somewhere in a, you know, in a very uninhabited region that you're currently powering via diesel places that you can't get um, infrastructure to easily. So we could potentially use these very small nuclear plants for those applications. The Department of Defense is very interested in them. So we are trying to move those technologies forward in order to create the potential for nuclear energy as part of the, the national you know, energy solutions in the future. So that's a huge focus for our lab, integrated energy systems. The third thing that we do that is very important is uh, cybersecurity for control systems. This may sound a little different, but we've been doing this for a long time here at INL, and it's very important for all our energy systems to make sure that we've got the appropriate <clears throat> protections on their, uh, you know, that keep us safe from cyber attack. So there's uh, that, that's sort of the big three things we do at INL. Marianne, a current events question. As Europe is scrambling for new energy supplies, given the war in Ukraine and the Russian embargo, what leadership role can INL and the United States play generally in demonstrating that civilian nuclear energy can and should be part of the equation, both from a global warming perspective and from an international security perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the international security role of nuclear has been neglected. Uh, it's, if we retreat, you know, if we retreat from nuclear energy in this country, and we still have 93 operating reactors that produce almost 20% of our electricity and more than half of our carbon-free electricity. But if we retreat from it, we lose the, we lose our place at the table internationally. Russia and China are both eager to build additional nuclear power plants across the world. And we really want U.S. technology to be part of that mix and U.S. safety standards and U.S. fuel cycle standards and non-proliferation standards because it's all wrapped up together uh, in terms of, you know, people's perceptions about non-proliferation. And the other thing, you know, with different fuel cycles, you have the potential to use fuels that are much less attractive as far as proliferation uh, uh, potential, right? Current white water re reactor fuels do produce plutonium. So you have to be very careful about how you, you know, how you deal with the, with the spent fuel. So there's just, how can we do this? Well, we have to engage in the, engage in the conversation. And we are starting, I know that the USDOE right now is, has a big effort on trying to address the uranium shortage that we could be facing due to the fact that we're not purchasing uranium from Russia right now. And we typically get, I believe it's about 20% of our uranium for our power reactors comes from Russia. So that's not to mention of all, of course, the issues with the European natural gas dependence on Russia and, and other things. How, so how can we, we are, they are working very hard right now at the Department of Energy to develop a strategy, and we have some experts from INL who are working with them on that strategy. Mar Marianne, to get a sense no of, of where your portfolio fits in, in terms of the overall national policy, mm -hmm. in Washington, what are the federal agencies, the offices, or even the individuals 
that you have direct interface with? Oh, that I talk to? Um, well, if, you know, all the people at the, at the Office of Nuclear Energy, which is one of the, so there's an assistant secretary who, who reports to the, to the Secretary of Energy, who is um, Katie Huff. She was just confirmed. So I have interaction with her uh, and with various deputy assistant secretaries as well in her office. So there's nuclear energy. She reports up through the S, what we call S4, the sec, uh, undersecretary for science. They just changed the name. It used to be science and energy, and I think it's now science and innovation. That's Jerry Richmond. She's from the University of Oregon, and she just started uh, several months ago. And so I interface with her, and I've known her for a number of years. And then uh, from a sort of a defense perspective, the National Nuclear Security Administration is run by Jill Ruby, who I know very, very well from Sandia. She used to be my direct supervisor from a long time, for about seven years. She is the S5, the Undersecretary for National Nuclear Security. I don't have a programmatic need to talk with Jill all the time, but I have access to her because you know, she's a friend of mine. And we do, uh, we do a lot of work also with, this is another oddity with the Department of Energy. We do a lot of work with uh, an organization called Naval Reactors, which is a part of NNSA, National Nuclear Security Administration, it's NA30. And, but it is also associated, part also associated very closely and part of the Department of Defense to some extent. It's also interwoven. And we run a facility called the Advanced Test Reactor out here at INL, which does thermal irradiation of the fuels that the Navy is considering for their nuclear fleet for the submarines and the, and the aircraft carriers. So we, we also at INL do have a big connection to NNSA through NA30 naval reactors. We also do some work for nonproliferation. Then in the Office of Science, uh, I don't know the new, newly confirmed uh, head of the Office of Science, but personally, although she is, a, I think, a geobiologist or so earth scientist, she must be good. But the uh, I do know the principal deputy associate director, Steve Binkley, and I, and I also know Harriet Kung, who is a C3, the head of the Office of Science Research Pro Programs very well also. So I talk with them occasionally. So it's mostly people in Department of Energy. Uh, in my past, I worked with the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission quite a bit. I worked a little bit with the TRA and a few other agencies, but I would say those contacts are sort of on the old side. Marianne, at INL, what are some opportunities for collaboration, both with academia and private industry? Oh, we do we do a lot of both. Uh, we have we have a couple of academic uh, collaborations, official ones that are run out of my office, which I didn't mention earlier. So we have one with the Idaho universities that the state of Idaho invests in. So they they want to have their universities working with Idaho National Laboratory for, as a sort of in a symbiotic way. You know, Idaho is a small state and, you know, from a population perspective, we have about 1.8 million people. We've got three research universities. We've got one national laboratory. We're, I believe, the sixth, it might be the seventh largest non-governmental employer in the state. And we're certainly the largest employer in eastern Idaho since we're located in Idaho Falls. So uh, we have this, this consortium with the state schools, which is called the Center for Advanced Energy Studies. So we work very closely with them. We try to work on things like joint proposals for research funding and development of employee, you know, future employees for the National Lab System or for high tech uh, anywhere. And then we have a, another consortium that we run with. It's got five uh, universities across the nation that all have nuclear engineering programs and nuclear research reactors on their campuses. And then we call that the National University Consortium or NUC, which I think is sort of cutesy, but I didn't name it. It was here before I got here. So we have, we have the, a lot of collaborations with them. Again, on we do joint appointments. So we have kind of faculty exchange and staff 
exchanging with faculty. We do joint research. Our internal research program, our LDRD program allows us to, you know, flexibility on funding universities, those types of things. So there's quite a bit of academic collaboration with regards to industry. DOE NE Nuclear Energy funds a number of programs that are very industry focused with lab participation. So they they we can put together proposals with industrial partners to the Department of Energy to be funded together. They could come to us to uh, to pay us. They can actually, there's a mechanism for industry to come to a national laboratory and ask us to do work for them that we're uniquely qualified to do. And so we can do that through cooperative research and development agreements or through projects where they just pay us to do R&D. And at INL, we have a number of really interesting and unique, particularly nuclear facilities that we can, that aren't available elsewhere in the country. Marianne, I can appreciate at Sandia where a seismology and geophysics background would be relevant in terms of nuclear weapons testings and, 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 and explosions. Is there also a place for this course of study analysis at INL? Yeah, yeah, although it's not, you know, seism seismology, we have a few seismologists on staff here at INL. I mean, I didn't get this job because I'm a seismologist. I think I got it because I, you know, have a long career of leadership in the national lab system. But the, although the guy who hired me, Mark Peters, by the way, was a postdoc at Caltech, uh -huh. and I, I, I can't remember who he worked with. Anyway, he's a geochemist. But he, um, he, so I'm sure he appreciated the, you know, the glories of being an earth scientist when, when looking at who to hire for this job. But the, we do have a uh, seismic hazard in our area, right? Uh, Idaho Falls is on the Snake River Plain, uh, flood basalts from the you know, Yellowstone hotspot, et cetera. So we have a network of seismometers that are out across this, the site. We have a lot of government land 890 square miles of it that start up, starts about half an hour west of Idaho Falls. We call it the site. And we have a network of both uh, you know, micro earthquakes, tight seismometers, but also strong motion accelerometers uh, that we monitor. And of course, we record regional and local and tell seismic seismicity with those, with those <coughs> networks. So we, we have a few. It's not big. Don't do a lot of programmatic stuff with seismology. We also have a program in geothermal. And so that's, uh, we're, we're a great location for geothermal. And we've worked at with on geothermal projects for many years at INL. I would say we're not at a high point on that now, but given the potential, you know, for geothermal to, especially with enhanced geothermal systems where you, you know, actively fracture the rock below the surface and pump water into it to extract hot water, we can have the potential, I think, to uh, do more with geothermal as a renewable and clean energy source. And so we're, we're certainly looking at trying to think about how we can best do that at INL. There are other labs that do geothermal as well, of course. Mary, this has been a great tour of what's going on currently. Let's go back now to the 1970s. As an yeah. undergraduate, yeah. were you specifically interested when you were at Hope College in seismology and geophysics was that on your radar even that early it was it was actually not when i started not when i started college when i first started which was in night fall of 1974 i i took um well hope is a liberal arts college so and it had at that time and i think it still does have a fairly large core curriculum but then it had really really substantial core curriculum so it took a lot of that stuff and i also enjoyed taking German in high school, so I took some German classes there too, but I took chemistry, physics, and, um, and math, you know, calculus. We didn't have calculus at my high school, so I had to start with Calc 1. And then uh, after about a semester, I realized that chemistry was not for me. I had a great high school chemistry teacher, and I thought I liked chemistry, but when I took it in college, even though I had a good professor, he was a good teacher, I realized this wasn't really my thing. But I still like physics. So I thought, hey, I've always liked, you know, volcanoes and, and rocks and stuff. And well, let's take a geology class. 
So I started, I didn't do that though till I was a sophomore. I took intro to geology when I was a sophomore. And I just thought that, no, that's not right. Until I took intro to geology, I think when I was a second, I think it's second, I don't remember. I started it late compared to the rest of the geology majors. Let's put it that way. While I was at college, I took intro and I thought, hey, this is fun. Let's take, let's, uh, I really like this, but I want to combine, it's pretty descriptive. I want to combine it with my physics. And it turned out that Hope had a, Hope had a already uh, a composite major for geology and physics that they had developed for a couple of previous students. And so it was described in the catalog and was an official major. So that's what I majored in, geology and physics as a composite. Turned out I was one course short of being a double major and it was a chemistry class that I didn't take. So I ended up with a, but yes, I was always interested in college by about, you know, by about the time I started as, I was a sophomore in, in seismology in particular. Yeah. Now, were there professors or did somebody give you a boost of confidence that a place like Caltech was within range for graduate school? That's a good question. I do remember that I had a particular geology professor. You know, I was of the of the generation where there were a lot of uh, women who didn't have you know long careers, right? And so I remember telling this guy, I think I was a junior in college. He said, "Well, what was I planning to do?" And I said, "Well, I thought I'd go to grad school, get a master's, and probably eventually I'd get married and have children." That's what I told him. And he said, by the way, I did get married and have children. But he said, um, why don't you get a PhD? And I said, I've never thought about getting a PhD. And that's interesting because I did have relatives who had PhDs. My, my dad was a first generation college student in his family, but my mother's family is very well educated. And she had a brother who was a chemistry professor at a small college. So I was familiar with PhDs, but it hadn't didn't occur to me to do it. So once he started thinking about that, I, he said that, I was like, huh, okay. And then I don't know if they really encouraged me to try to apply to Caltech or not, but you know, Caltech was like the place to go for seismology. And I wanted, I was interested in seismology. So I thought I would give it a shot. I also applied for an NSF graduate fellowship and and miraculously was awarded one of those. So I, I, I got lucky on that. But yeah, they were very encouraging, certainly. Although I do remember one of the physics professors telling me uh, that I, you know, I wasn't going to be at Little Hope College when I went to Caltech and I better be ready <laughs> for the big world. <laughs> Marianne, when you got to Caltech, first of all, at the Seismolab, were there other women graduate students? Were you part of that sort of inaugural class? No, that well, so there were there were graduate students who were women who were there ahead of me. One had just graduated before I arrived, and I've never actually met her. Her name is Sue Rakes, and she was British, and she went back to Britain, I believe, after she graduated. And I have, have never actually encountered her. Uh, there were two women graduate students in the Seismo Lab, and there was one geology student, uh, Joanna Vizgirda, who worked with Tom Ahrens, and I believe she was officially a ge geology student, although I'm not 100% sure, but she's not a seismologist. She might have been listed as being in the seismo lab. I'm a little uh, fuzzy on that. But we had Pat Scott and Sui Lin Liu, who were both in the class right before me. So, uh, and yeah, and then there were two more who came in the class after me, Holly Eisler and Vicki Lefebvre. And so I, when I arrived, there were three, me, Suelen, and Pat. When you got to the Seismo Lab, first of all, what were your impressions? Hmm, good question. Um, I was completely intimidated. It's a, you know, Caltech is a very challenging place, I think. Um, you know, and I came from this little college, and a lot of the people came from, you know, pretty impressive schools. And uh, and everybody questioned everything that you did. So it's you know, and let's let's take a look at some of my classmates, right? So I, there were six of us originally, and then one of them left. A guy, I think it was from Venezuela, uh, left after the first year. 
but the five, my four classmates were Terry Wallace, Thorn Lay, Mario Basilio, and Tom Hearn. And Terry, of course, uh, had a long career at Arizona. I'm sure you interviewed him and also um, then became eventually had peaked his career as being uh, uh, the director of Los Alamos for a year or so. And uh, Thorne is a you know eminent seismologist at Santa Cruz, and Tom Hearn was at uh, is at still at New Mexico State as a professor, and Mario went into industry. So it was a pretty it's a pretty intimidating group. Did you have a good idea of what you wanted to focus on when you got to the Science Bowl Lab? Were you wide open in terms of topics and even professors to connect with? I was wide open. I think one of the things, the great things about the Seismo Lab is that they don't force you to pick an advisor before you show up. And and I understand from my recent visit to Caltech back in January that they still have this open funding model where you can do a variety of things with different professors. I think that's absolutely fabulous. It was a terrific opportunity. So yeah, I, I had to, Certainly, I had to focus on my classwork to begin with. I was behind in math compared to a lot of people. Honestly, Hope College did not have some of the classes that I should have had in math, so I had to I had to try to pick pick it up pretty quickly, and that's probably and that was a struggle for me. So I, I had some self confidence issues at the beginning, and I would have to say that um, no, I won't say that. But I had some self-confidence issues at the at the beginning, and it took me a while. I, there was a female postdoc there, Chris Powell, who is uh, still working, I believe, and she um, she got me started on a on a uh, project that I used for my one of my propositions for my orals, my first one, my biggest one, and uh, and then after she left, I sort of transitioned over to Bernard Minster, who then left and went to, down to SEIC, I believe, in San Diego, later UC San Diego. And so then Don Anderson took me on. But it was sort of a, you know, an interesting relationship with, you know, I didn't start with Don Anderson because I wanted to do Don Anderson stuff. I started, I sort of evolved into it. I did a, a orals project with Hiro Kanamori and I did do one with Don, my third one. Um, we had to do three at that time. So it was, uh, um, you know, it was an evolution, just trying to get to know people and, and figure out what I wanted to do. But I was initially interested in earth structure seismology, and that's what I stayed in. Marianne, once you got comfortable at the lab, got the lay of the land, what were some of the big debates in the late 70s and early 80s. This is after plate mm -hmm. tectonics. What yeah. were the professors really excited about at that point? Well, we were really doing synthetic seismograms really for the first time, and that was really evolving in terms of doing high fidelity source modeling. Now, what so, does that mean, uh, synthetic seismograms? Well, just creating a seismogram from first principles based on Earth structure you know, with a computer, right? And so Don Holmberger was huge in this. and. And you know, Canard de Hoop, and then Dave Harkrider did the, you know, more of the surface wave stuff and matrices. Normal, uh, Don Anderson was doing it with normal modes. You could do this at different wavelengths, right? So, body waves, surface waves, but just trying to mimic what the Earth had shown you, without. Um, you know, from first principles, essentially, and saying, okay, if the Earth model is this, this is what my, seismo my seismograms are going to look like. I, I still remember Terry Wallace putting together something that I thought looked I don't know, not that great, but he was very excited about it because it was a strong motion synthetic. So this was, those were the, and now it's quite routine to create models of what, you know, your wave, entire wave fields, right, that that you can create uh, that are created from models and we have magnificent computing power. Now, when I got to Caltech, we had, they had just bought the prime mini computer. So um, my spouse who graduated from Caltech a year before me, first year, he started a year before me, he had to use cards. He used to have to use decks of cards and go over to the, to the computing center at Caltech. I didn't have to do that. We had a, 
the prime right there in the building, but we had to go to the, the computer room to sit down to computer terminal. And later on, we got each lab, each office, each graduate student office got its own terminal. That was, that was, you know, great. I didn't ever see a PC until I got to, to Sandia. So it was a different world for computing. And of course, the, the fidelity at which we can model seismic weight fields was quite different back then. But that, that was, to me, the, that's what everybody was excited about. And there were other things too, of course, but that's what I remember. When did you connect with Robert Clayton? Well, when he came. Uh, so Rob came when I was a fourth year student. And so we were already well along and I was already doing some, I'd, I'd started doing work on upper mantle uh, velocities using the Caltech array, uh, but not in the wave field sense, so well, you know, profiles, profile modeling, and was using WKBJ methods. And Rob came, uh, yeah, what fall of my, when I was a fourth year student, so I took his class. And uh, yeah, and we started doing some, some work together. And what was his focus at that point? What brought him to Caltech? I think, well, you should, can ask Rob, he's right there, but, but I think, you know, he, he was more of an exploration seismologist at Stanford, right? So, so I think Caltech was interested in broadening their uh, faculty uh, expertise into that area. But what was interesting to me was once Rob got to Caltech, he started doing earthquakes. So not oil field seismology anymore because it was, you know, it's just that much fun, right? Marianne, so did you do that. did you do field work at all as a graduate student? I really didn't. Um, a lot of the graduate students did, but I, I never really got into that. I do think I, I would have to check this, but if I was not the first, I was one of the first students who did all their entire all their data for their thesis was digital. So it was very common back in those days to you to do global network. Uh, data that you actually had, it was on microfiche, or in some cases, big long pieces of paper that you would have to put at a digitizer and digitize it. I know my husband did that for his thesis, and he was a surface wave guy, but but they would actually have to sit there and pick points and enter it into the computer. They would then enter into the computer. So the data that I used was all from the Southern California network, and it was all originally digital. And so that made it easier. It was also already there, right? So I didn't, I didn't go aftershock chasing. Uh, people who did that at that time still, they use smoke paper recorders, right? Where you actually would take a, a flame and, and put a layer of, uh, of smoke basically on a piece of paper. And then the, there would be a stylus that would scratch out your seismogram for you to record aftershocks. Marian, in analyzing all of this data coming in, what were some of the theories that were important that might have served as intellectual guideposts? Well, I was looking at, um, I looked at upper mantle discontinuities. So we were looking at, are there differences in the depths of the 400 kilometer discontinuity, the 670, you know, is it 660, 670, was it 390, 410? Uh, and then, of course, Don Anderson was big into his layman discontinuity or the, um, you know, was there a big global discontinuity around 200? So that was a big question. Um, a lot of people, you know, I didn't really look at that depth range for, for, my, for my thesis. I was mostly looking at, uh, well, at least for the, the part where I was looking at Gulf of California and Cascadia, I was looking at the 400 and the 670. Um, and so there was a, you know, and then connecting it to the petrology, right? So what causes these these P wave discontinuities in the upper mantle from a from a petrologic perspective? Is it phase chemical changes, phase changes? What happens to make that happen? And and trying to understand the seismic wave speeds down there would um, give you perhaps provide you with some constraints on what was happening from a, from a composition and pressure perspective, composition perspective in particular. Now, was Clayton and Anderson, were they co-advisors on your thesis? 
Well, officially, Rob was uh, officially Don was my thesis advisor. I would say I worked more with Rob the last two years I was there. And was so that, that that's because... the glories of the seismal lab? You could do that. And is that because what you were doing was more in alignment with what he was doing at that point? Yeah, yeah, I think. And then I, you know, I did a little bit of, you know, Don Helmberger, certainly, I would go and talk to him about the modeling and the other graduate students. Um, Steve Grand, who was there, was doing a lot with S-Wave upper mantle modeling, and he developed some really good, uh, important shear wave models for, for tectonically active areas that you know served as a base and or you know counterpoint to the p wave models i was using and looking at for similar areas i was very lucky because i got some really good data from the southern california network that um, were really unusually good for that time period uh, just sort of being lucky you know some sometimes seismology is being lucky so, but, but yeah, I think, you know, John was really into more into the rock physics stuff at that point, you know, people evolve over their careers and, you know, he had such an illustrious career. He could afford to go in he, he, and he wasn't afraid of controversy, right? He would go into, to go into these areas and some people would say, oh, what, what does he know about that? Right. But, but uh, he could do that. And uh, from a seismic perspective, um, you know, I think what I was, Rob was more well-lined with what I was doing. Yeah. I, I sort of was out on my own a little bit, too. Speaking, you know, and you do that once you're a fourth or fifth year student. You can do that. You can do that. Speaking of controversy, did you get involved at all in some of the debates around earthquake prediction? I didn't. I think that was pretty much, you know, like the dilatancy theory and stuff. I think that was more, they were still talking about it when I was there, but that was more before I arrived. Yeah, yeah. They were going around. I know there were some guys going around. One of my co-students, Jeff Given, was went around every month and taking gravity measurements. They were doing this sort of gravity over time stuff to see what that you know if that was illuminating in any way. And of course, radon was big at that time. But Mary, I didn't any do that myself. Marion, did JPL was that an asset for you at all during graduate school? I would say not for me personally. I mean, I think JPL is an amazing institution. It's wonderful. And, it's, and we, you know, I got to go over there once or twice. A lot of the planetary sciences students, of course, were over there all the time. I didn't, um, I didn't really uh, get involved with anything at JPL, no. What would you say some of your contributions or conclusions were in your thesis? Uh, I wrote my thesis a long time ago. Oh, it's, uh, huh. so, so there were some, the very first paper I wrote about, you know, a little bit shallower upper mantle in the, in the, underneath Southern California was more about uh, a little illuminating some of the velocity, lateral velocity variations around the transverse ranges. And I came to some conclusions that were a little different from what previous people had done using a sort of an interesting technique called relative array diagrams that was from Chris Powell. She, she was the one who first uh, uh, showed me how to do that. Uh, with regards to the uh, upper mantle structure and profile, there was a very uh, fast beneath this, beneath I had a data that showed that probed the essentially the upper mantle beneath the Gulf of California, so as an active spreading center. So that's the paper that I've written that has actually been cited quite a number of times. And it had a very large gradient above the 400 kilometer discontinuity. And then I was able to see some fairly fine structure on the 660. And I think the 660 has held up pretty well as about the right depth, although I've lost track over the last 20 years what people are thinking these days. And, uh, and then I did some cool stuff with Rob on wave field continuation uh, for, for upper mantle. So just some, some, uh, some different ways of looking at these uh, seismic profile data, but it, it's, it's um, you know, just some, some good data 
I've, I've been pleased that some of my data profiles were included in some textbooks, so that was sort of fun. Um, but, um, you know, and then I did a comparison of the Gulf of California with the Cascadia zone, and it was a different gradient above the 400. So, you know, just some basic knowledge about, which I think has held up reasonably well um, about the upper mantle structure. Marianne, by the time you defended, were you looking broadly? Were you looking in and industry, academia, and at national labs? No, I, uh, I had decided partway through graduate school that academia wasn't for me. So I looked at how hard these guys worked. And, uh, and, and I honestly just didn't think that was me, right? So I, I, I think I sort of, I didn't know myself then, but um, I found out later that really sort of management leadership of the scientific enterprise was more something that I had a, what I would say more of a distinguishing characteristic as in the ability to do that. Whereas I think I was an okay scientist. I was on not as brilliant as many of the people who went through Caltech, just to be honest, I, I could tell that. So what could I do? What was I really interested in doing with my life? And so I didn't think academia would be right. So I was looking at industry and I looked at national labs. There was a guy actually who I saw very recently just by chance named John Rundle, who used to work at Sandia, who was a visiting scholar at Caltech. He would come and hang out. So I knew about Sandia from him. And then my husband, who we, we were not married at the time, he got a job at Sandia. And so then I became very interested in getting a job at Sandia as well. I left, he graduated in, in uh, 83, and I graduated in 84. And uh, so I applied to Sandia. I also applied to several other, a couple of oil companies and a postdoc position. And I got two, I, I got several job offers, but I got the one at Sandia. So that was where I was going to go so I could, you know, hang out with Eric. There you have it. During the Cold War, right after Abel Archer, was nuclear security, nuclear verification, was that a really important part of Sandia's portfolio at that point? Oh, absolutely. And so that's, so actually, Sandia had about three different areas where they used geophysicists at that time. One was in the treaty verification organization directly. Another was in energy organizations, so geothermal, magma, energy types of things. And I wrote some papers on, in that area. I also wrote some papers in nonproliferation. But then we also had a research geophysics group that was supposed to be more fundamental research. And that's the one I joined. So when my husband went, he uh, started with the more of the applied energy area. And then he migrated over to nonproliferation where he stayed the rest of his career. And he became a distinguished staff member at Sandia and retired in 2016, I believe. So, um, but then I went into to management fairly early. But yeah, we were doing, we were still doing nuclear testing out at Nevada test site at that point. Sandia ran a network that recorded the ground motions from the nuclear tests at, you know, sort of 10 to 50 kilometer ranges so pretty close but not right right on top of it all they, they did some close in instrumentation as well and then of course there were the global networks for non-proliferation that that sandia and los alamos and livermore all had a hand in monitoring and i mean not the day-to-day -day monitoring but analyzing the data understanding the verification issues marianne what was your first job at sandia my first job was member of technical staff in the geophysics department so I would, I did, they didn't have a lot of, you know, I got to sort of figure out what I wanted to work on. I mean, there were some funding constraints, but I had a project in, was funded by the Magma Energy Program at the time, which was sort of an offshoot of geothermal. Could you put a heat exchanger into a body of magma and exchange and extract heat? Well, a couple of problems. One is getting the heat out. The other is you know, having, their, having your heat exchanger survive. Another is finding the magma. So. I was working, by that point, I started working on some tomography stuff with Rob Clayton. Well, I, so I would go back to Caltech periodically, and I worked with Rob on that. And we, we did a paper on COSO, on uh, tomography, and so looking for low-velocity regions that could be magma. 
So that was fun. So I did that was part, of, but that was only part of what I did. The other part was uh, when I first started was looking at ground motion data at the test site from from a certain set of explosions on Pahu Mesa that went were recorded at a place called Jackass Flats that had very unusual um, amplification. So I was trying to, and there was about 50 kilometers distance. So I was trying to figure out what the uh, why this amplification occurred. It was on a very, very small uh, geographic area. They had put a little array of, size, of ground motion instruments out there to try to map out this anomaly. And I did some, I did some work on that. I also looked at uh, ground motions from nuclear explosions recorded at Yucca Mountain, Nevada, because they were, of course, thinking about the about the uh, potential repository for spent nuclear fuel, commercial nuclear fuel there. And so they needed to, at that point, they were still setting off explosions at NTS. And so the question is, how big, how much did that shake that amount? Well, the answer was not a heck of a lot. Mary, in this initial work, did any of it require a clearance? Was it classified? Well, everybody at Sandia had to get a clearance. So I got one. Uh, did my first work require it? No, I don't think so. When, when did you start to get more into the national security side of things? Oh, within a year or two, I started working on some of the treaty verification things. And at that point, they had the treaty verification people all in a, in a, in a controlled area, a SCIF. Um, they didn't all need to be in there, but it was just easier. And yeah, I did, you know, we did things like hard and deeply buried targets over the years, um, ground penetrating weapons, uh, requiring no knowledge of geoscience. And, uh, and but a lot of the treaty verification research itself is not classified. So I mean, but I've done you know I've used my clearances over the years certainly for a variety of topics. But I never actually worked directly on nuclear weapon design or or engineering. Now with the but, verification, did you work directly with either the State Department or the ACDA? No, no. This is all DOE. DOE has a. It's so, uh, NA-22 is the Office of Research and Development for Nuclear Nonproliferation part of it. They've had a very long-standing program with the three national security labs, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Livermore, on just, you know, discrimination of earthquakes from explosions using very, you know, various wavelengths various di at various distances for various sizes of, um, of things, and, you know, over time I, I after i got out of management it went into management i got out of doing the actual r d in that area and i do think you know some things about it were certainly classified like you know north korea sets off a test and what can we tell about that we probably don't want to tell that to other people but we the sandia and the other labs would certainly had people looking at those very carefully and trying to see what they could determine and then some of that would be publishable and some of it wouldn't be. So there are various aspects of it. Between the R&D and the verification, where was their overlap with Livermore and Los Alamos? And where did Sandia have its own unique portfolio? Sandia was typically focusing on, on the, what they called automated data processing. Um, and there were swim lanes, but they, uh, you know, they were, I think Los Alamos had a particular geographic region and Livermore had a different one. My husband knows more about this stuff than me. You could ask him. But uh, it, yeah, Sandia was more in the automated data processing system. So they had to, they built one, uh, this was in the 90s, for AFTAC out of Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. Eric was traveling back and forth there all the time and we had our first child, so that was interesting. But it was... Uh, um, that was Sandia led the system to and to bring in the data and do do analysis of you know processing of the data triggers you know when 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 was there an event identifying events those types of things. How long after you joined Sandia would you say you were already on a management and leadership track? Well, it's hard to say, but I would I I have to admit that the. Within the first week that I was there, when I sat down with my supervisor, he asked me if I was, would consider going into management. And I think part of that was, uh, uh, well, you know, it might have been part of my experience at Caltech and that I 
grand things like the softball team and <laughs> ski trips and stuff. And I don't know, certain people like to do that. But yeah, so he asked me about that early on in my career. And actually, I became the manager of the group that I was in after six years, which is pretty early for, for somebody to go from staff to management. Because he, that same guy, he left the group at that point. He was actually a mechanical engineer. I thought it would be good if we had a geophysicist running the geophysics <laughs> group. Mary, moving into the 1990s, how did the end of the Cold War change things at Sandia? Oh, it changed them quite a bit. We had a lot of budgetary um, uncertainties, I would say, because, uh, and no new nuclear weapons programs, right? So there was a bit of a dearth in hiring. And so that has, um, you know, propagated its way through the workforce, but as we've gone on, but and of course now people who are who are um, hired at that point are sort of, you know, in their, you know, prime prime of their, uh, you know, upper level careers. But uh, I'd, I'd say it really affected our ability to bring in new talent and our emphases changed. So at that point, a lot of the labs went into things more aggressively, pursued things that they weren't hadn't done before because they didn't have as much support from the weapons program. So from the national, you know, the national security labs. So they, it was more of a little bit of, you know, going after funding from various parts of DOE in order to maintain programs and maintain, uh, you know, employment for your researchers. So we broadened quite a bit. At what point, I don't know if it was gradual or there was a specific initiative, at what point did Sandia start to get involved in climate and sustainability issues? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure I can give you a date on that. There was a, I believe that we didn't actually form a climate program maybe until 2010-ish. Um, at that point, I was, uh, let's see. I became a center director at Sandia in 20, 2009, but I was running a nu the Nuclear Energy and Global Security Center. But I believe Rick Stulen, who was uh, at Sandia, California, started the climate program at Sandia. I think it might have been 2010. I suppose it could have been 29, 2009. But it was nascent at that point. It's, but yeah, you're right. I mean, these are the big... The big changes right over the national laboratories and national security laboratories. First, you had the, the weapons focus and the national security focus. Of course, then then that's all that was in the old days. Then energy crisis, right in the 70s. So everybody started doing energy, and then in now the shift towards climate. If you look at it over you know several decades time scale. Another big change, of course, September 11th and the mm -hmm. Wenho Lee scandal at Los Alamos. How did the security environment change at Sandia? Well, I don't know. Um, certainly, you know, the security, certainly 9-11 was huge and we started working with DHS and um, a lot of security things that was huge. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the operational security environment, Sandia always had really good operational security. I think, you know, the big things that I remember were the, when cell phones started coming in and, and Bluetooth devices after that, uh, the, then there was a lot more angst about, you know, the ability of somebody to screw up on, on your security because you couldn't take a cell phone into a limited area. And we have, and Sandia is almost entirely a limited area. Turned out the building that I worked in was not, it was what's called a property protection area. So I could have my cell phone there, but if I took my cell phone into the limited area, which there was nothing to stop me from as a turnstile and I, you know, use your badge and a pin to get in there, I would then, you know, have had have to report that to security and possibly be, you know, given some sort of, um, you know, violation or, or uh, infraction as they call it. So those were big changes um, in terms of the, was there a, was there an, uh, yeah, there was definitely increasing in amount of work that we did in that realm that required high security. 
I wasn't typically incredibly involved in all of that, but there was a big org the, our organization that did that kind of work got bigger, a lot bigger after 9-11. Yes. What was some of the advisory work that you did in Washington, around the country that was important to you personally, but also there was a lot of mutual benefit to what you were doing within the national lab system? Well, I think I think my advisory work has started you know, maybe a little bit more recently um, in terms of being, you know, within the last 10 to 15 years in terms of being on panels of various types. I've been on a lot of review boards for, well, I guess I started back when, with LDL. I probably started back in like 2000. So, yeah, I mean, the last 20 years trying to... Uh, you know, help primarily other national laboratories with a lot of times with their earth science programs and, you know, reviewing the strategy there and, and, you know, they always ask you to review the quality of the research. Typically, I think the quality of the research is very good. It's more about, you know, how are you attracting, retaining, mentoring staff? Are you working on the right things? Does what you say you're focusing on make sense? within the DOE ecosystem, those types of things. Um, I think the, the, I got to know a lot of people more across the laboratory system around mid 2010s when we started doing some laboratory system initiatives around earth science that I was lucky enough to co-lead with Susan Hubbard, who was in LBNL. She's now at Oak Ridge. She has this, the same job I have here at INL at Oak Ridge. She just started this spring. And we started a, a cross laboratory initiative with the Department of Energy on subsurface science, which was a great tool um, to get to know, you know, really get to know the earth science community across the entire national laboratory system. And, you know, try to think about strategic directions for the future and see how much we could convince DOE to um, you know, see the wisdom and in, in looking at the big things, the, the issues there was trying to develop funding streams uh, from the Department of Energy because of the way they were funded. It was it was a tough, tough row, but a tough hoe to row, what? road to hoe, road, road to hoe, hoe. <laughs> tough road to hoe. But we, uh, I think there were a lot of positive things that came out of that, and I made a lot of positive relationships. So, yeah, now I'm on... Um, various boards. I'm on the Texas Animal Energy Institute board. I got, when I was in, at San Diego, California, so in 2015, I got the opportunity to go out and lead the Cal, San Diego, California site, which at the time had 1,300 people. It's bigger now. Um, but in that role, I got to be on the board of directors for the California Council of Science and Technology, which is sort of, um, it's sort of like AAAS, but for the for California, it's it's pretty cool, and I, I enjoyed that. And also Bay Area, a Bay Area Innovation Board, and all of those things give you insights into what other people are doing, uh, you know, in the science community, and that you can hopefully give you ideas that you can hopefully go back and take to your facility and you know harvest the best of those and and try to implement. Marianne, what was your most recent job at Sandia? That was my most recent job. The title was vice president for the California Laboratory. I was also the vice president for the energy and climate program that Sandia had at the time. And that was from 2015 to 2017. And that was dual headed or that was one role with two responsibilities? Well, I had, I mean, everybody, at, every person at leader at Sandia had a program job and a line job. So my line job was the uh, California Laboratory, and so I lived in Livermore, Cal California for that. And then my program role was for Energy and Climate, which was the smallest program at Sandia, but even so it was $230 million a year. And that was mostly, most of the work for that program occurred in Albuquerque. So I was back and forth between Albuquerque and California all the time. And so in that role, I got to interface with a very wide variety of people at the Department of Energy back in the, that time frame because we did work for, Sandia did work for EERE, you know, Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy. We did work for nuclear energy. We did work for fossil. 
uh, we were, they worked, our Office of Science work at Sandia was in that program. Any work we did with climate uh, was in that program. So it was a, you know, a very broad based program, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Tell me about the opportunity at INL and why that was attractive to you at that point. Well, you know, I left Sandia because of a contract change. So every every national laboratory has a contract and certain people on the contract are named as key personnel. And at Sandia, the vice presidents were all key personnel. So uh, NNSA decided to rebid our contract in 2015. Our lab director, Jill Ruby, now the NNSA administrator, uh, decided she asked the, the whole entire leadership team to bid with her with Lockheed Martin. And we put together what we considered to be a, a really good package and we submitted it. And then in December of 2016, we decided, we found out that NNSA had chosen not to renew our contract and they were going to give it to Honeywell. Okay, so that meant I was going to retire in January or leave the laboratory anyway, in May of 2017. So that next several months was I was 60 years old at the time. The next several months was very busy with all these transition activities. And I thought a little bit about, did I want to try to take a job or not? And I looked around at some volunteer opportunities and I finally decided to just uh, retire, do a few of these activities, boards. I did a little consulting for Los Alamos after I retired and um, moved back to Albuquerque. We had never sold the house. So moved back into the house, you know, went hiking, played my violin, all that sort of stuff. Um, but after a while, it just wasn't. You weren't that, ready yet. I wasn't ready. I didn't get to retire on my own terms. So, so a friend of mine from Sandia, California, who had then gone to work at PNNL, alerted me to this job that, uh, that INL had which was very different from my job at Sandia. So my job at Sandia would now be called, and they have actually have retitled them now, they're called Associate Lab Director. So it's a, a program and a, and a line job. Different labs, in some labs it's only line, in some labs it's only program, and some it's both. Uh, here at INL it's pretty much both for our ALDs. But that was a, you know, a big, huge line, lots of people, lots of program responsibility. This DLD job for the deputy lab director and the CRO is got a very small group of people that work with me, and I, I work on things that are a little bit more global with respect to the laboratory and more general science. And INL is a lab that has had a lot of changes over the years in their mission, and they have had a have huge focus on demonstration and very applied stuff and very much less on more fundamental science. So the, the laboratory leadership, the director, Mark Peters, really wanted to amp up, you know, keep working on developing our science base, our fundamental science base. And he, he had a deputy lab director who was leaving and was actually part of a bid team for Los Alamos, which so INL, sorry, back up, but INL is run by Battelle Energy Alliance, which is a, a Battelle uh, LLC. Battelle bid, bid on Los Alamos and they won. And so when they put, they have to put together a bid team and the previous INL deputy lab director for science was on that bid team. So he had, he was obligated when they won that bid to go work at Los Alamos. So he did that. So that opened up this job that I have. And so when I heard about it, and you know, they had this need to, to develop our you know, research excellence for the laboratory to a level that it had not been at previously. And um, I thought, you know, maybe I can help this lab. And it's in a part of the country I've never lived in, and it would be fun. We're an hour and a half from Jackson Hole. That is not bad. That's you know? not bad. I can get to Yellowstone in two hours. I can get to Sun Valley in two and, a, two and a half hours if I drive fast. And so Salt Lake in three hours. So so there's, it's a nice location. My husband was interested in going north and my kids were all grown. And so, hey. An so adventure. Tried, an adventure, right, just to finish my career out. 
just to bring our story right up to the present, what are you currently working on? What are some of the key projects in your portfolio? Yeah. Well, we are, uh, let's see, let's first, let's go back to, to, to our LDRD program, Laboratory Directed Research and Development. Uh, you're allowed to tax your incoming funds to create a pool of indirect money to do research under this program. All the, all the contractor-run labs, the 16 of them do this at varying levels. INL has always had a very small program. So when I was at Sandia, the LDRD program was $160 million a year, and I know it's significantly larger than that now. Um, when I came to INL, its program was $27 million a year, and it only represented about 2% of the annual budget of INL. So what we've been doing very mindfully over the last three years I've been here is improving the management and the focus of the program and growing it. So this year we're at 40 million and next year we're gonna be at 47 million. You have to work that with DOE on the size of it and just running that program. And I knew a lot about LDRD from my time at Sandia. I knew how to run an LDRD program, uh, even though I'd never been in charge of Sandia's, but, uh, but so that's one thing that we do. Uh, the lab plan is sort of an annual thing that we always do, and that um, is sort of a, it's not really an initiative, but it's just something we do. But another thing that we're working on right now is something we're calling a research culture initiative at INL to try to take to the next level our research community. We have really grown the number of PhD scientists that we have at INL, which was not that large. And when I arrived, we only had on the order of 30 postdoctoral associates at INL. We're now up to 100. So I've been working on that. Uh, many of the labs have many more than that. Some of them have, a couple of them have 500 or so. So we're still relatively limited postdoc program, but it's an important thing to help us get new research blood into the laboratory and to um, just you know, bring in new ideas from elsewhere. It's, it's just a win-win to have, if you have a good postdoc program and we have provide good experiences for them, we hire some of them and the ones that we don't hire, if they've got had a good experience, they go out and they're an advocate for our laboratory and they can continue to work with us, say from a, a university where they're a professor. So we've, I've been working on, you know, upping and improving our postdoc program. And now we're working on more, general concepts of research excellence like you know how much of our work can we put can we publish because the national laboratories some of them have a reputation for not getting their work out into the into the greater community and i would say that inl is can do better in that realm and so we're working on on that and and just you know mentoring our you know attracting and retaining a diverse workforce. I do work quite a bit on diversity, particularly gender diversity. I am the top person female in the laboratory from a technical perspective. I'm probably top for any perspective. So I have a responsibility as a role model. So I go out and I do things like we last Friday, we had an event here we call it My Amazing Future, which was about 300 or so eighth grade girls from around Eastern Idaho who came in. So I did a little keynote for them and participated in a mentor session. So I do things like that as well. But but the things, you know, I'm sorry, I, I do have a tendency to wander around a little when I talk. But no, no. The, big, the big things that we're working on is, is really research excellence. Uh, how, how do we take INL to the next level? It's got started before I got here. There's no question about it. What I've been trying to do is to mature those programs and, and make them, uh, you know, really well integrated into the laboratory. Uh, so everybody understands the importance of research to our, to our community. And I work with our university partners a lot on that too. Mary, now that we've worked right up to the present for the last part of our talk, a few retrospective questions. Then we'll end looking to the future. So obviously you've moved away from geophysics in the course of your career, but I wonder if you can reflect on some of the things you learned at the Seismo Lab, collaboration, leadership, approach to the science that have stayed with you, that have served you so well in your career. Yeah. Well, one thing, I'm, I'm going to be maybe a little bit out on the edge here, but uh, 
I think if you look in the National Laboratory System, you will see an unusual or an overrepresentation of earth scientists and their leadership. That I haven't done a statistical study on this, but even when I was at Sandia, when Sandia might have had, I don't know, 100 earth scientists or so, we always had a few in very upper management. And so why is that? So I think that earth science, and, and right now I just mentioned my friend Susan Hubbard, who's she's a geophysicist, who's the CRO at Oak Ridge. Mark Peters was the lab director here. He's a geochemist. There, you know, everywhere you look and you turn over the leaf, there's there's some connection to earth science. So not everywhere, but you know what I mean. So uh, my view is that it's the inherent interdisciplinarity of earth science that makes, that helps people think broader systems thinking um, and, and enables people to be, you know, gives them a leg up on leadership. I think that's, I think that's very important. I do also think, you know, I got a lot of help at Sandia uh, from a lot of really good leadership programs leadership that helped develop skills and how to be leaders. It, I think it also helped that I, I like working with people. I've always liked doing that. I mean, I wouldn't have run the, the Seismolab softball team if I didn't enjoy doing that. Maybe I like telling people what to do. I don't know, but it's, <laughs> uh, and we, that was the man I taught, you know, I actually have a, have to do a, had to do a career story talk when I was the, Vice President Sandy a few times, and I always showed this picture of the Seismolab softball team because when I was there, we were just starting to get students from China, and they came and they had no idea. They never played softball or baseball. They had no idea how to do it, but they all wanted to play. They want to be part of the team, and we played in the Caltech C League, and I don't know what Caltech has now in terms of leagues, but it was the lowest one at the time, and they would let us play, you play 10 people on the field, but everybody batted. So we would get, for our, when we, we were called, when I first got there, we were called the strike slips. But then I think we, we started, I don't know what they're called now, but I, but, but they were, we were called the tremors after that. And that, that was because we had a little bit of a schism after a while. Some of the better players led by Terry Wallace wanted to go off and play in the Caltech A League and which was fast pitch, not slow pitch. And, and uh, because didn't think it was, I don't know why he thought that you'd have to ask Terry, but he took some of the good people off. And so I think that might be when the names change happened, but I don't really recall actually. But because we, I, so I was running this team and we had to put, we had these people who have a, a wide range of skill. And I would have to say in the skill range, I personally was probably in the bottom third. We had a wide range of skill and we had to put every inning, you could put different people on the field and you went through your batting order. So before every game you had to start, uh, you had to put together a batting order and you had to decide, okay, I've got five people who are really never gonna get a hit here. Do I disperse them or in the batting order or do I put them all in the same place and just you know hope that we can get through this and, and maybe get to the people who could actually get on base? And then where do you put your people who have never touched a softball in their life and couldn't catch one to save their life? Uh, usually you put them in short field and then you hope the center fielder can get over there and help them. That's, that was, that was an, easy, an easy fix. But I felt that that was a, a good training for management and leadership because I had to get people to go along with me because of course there were people who were there who didn't, well, there were several types of people. There were people who really wanted to win. There were people who were there to drink beer. And then there were people who wanted to sort of wanted to win and they wanted to help you figure out how to win, right? So uh, you, had to, you had to work that, you had to work with people and, and get them to figure out that what you were proposing might be okay and then, and then get them to do it. And, and then occasionally we won some games. I honestly don't think we won a lot, but it was, it was still fun. So I enjoyed it. So, so I think there were a lot of opportunities for, um, in that, in that, in those types of activities, to to learn how to be a to be a leader, and 
Yeah, I don't know. I think I lost my train of thought. That's so. fine. That's fine. Marianne, and looking over the course of your career and all of the ways that you've worked to advance the national interest in nuclear security, climate change, diversity in the field, what are you most proud of and where do you think you've made the biggest impact? Oh, that's, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I mean, scientifically, I didn't have a particularly long research career, so I think probably what the, you know, the things I'm most proud of is being able to elevate earth science at Sandia was one thing. I did was able to convince Sandia Upper Management when I was sort of a mid-upper level manager to create what was called a research foundation for earth sciences, which hadn't previously existed there, uh, which brought some uh, attention, some funding, and some, I think, more legitimacy to the importance of earth science to the national laboratory system. I think the some of the work that Susan and I did with, with our subsurface initiative was also uh, impactful across the national lab system in building community and building a recognition of what earth scientists can do and how important they can be for DOE because there are earth scientists at not all, but more than half, well over half, probably two thirds to three quarters of the laboratories have earth scientists. And they're always there for a reason. Pretty much all the labs need them for something, but it's never the prime thing. We don't have an earth science lab. I mean, NETL would be the closest thing that we have for that. And it's not, they don't have a large research staff. So what's the, you know, trying to help people understand the importance of that. And of course, climate has helped with that a lot, but a lot of the climate stuff is atmospheric and I'm always thinking solid earth. So you have to forgive me for that. But the, uh, I think that was was impactful, and I think I've been had an impact on INL in terms of um, identifying when when I you know if some of the things that we were doing a few years ago weren't you know they weren't all that good, right? And so somebody has to call them out on that stuff. And hey, if you want to provide critical um, critical commentary on something. What better place to be trained at than at Caltech? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a reputation here at INL for being direct. I've been told many times, and uh, okay, but I think that it has helped help the research environment here and the research quality of what we're putting out right now is, I think, better than it's probably ever been, and so I am I am proud of that. Finally, Mary, and last question looking to the future. Have you topped out in your career or is there one more job ahead of this one, do you think? There are no more jobs. No, I am I'm going to retire in a couple of years and uh, our you know, Mark Peters left and I could I thought for a little bit about whether or not I wanted to apply for the lab director job here and I decided not to and I'm very happy that I decided not to. Lab director jobs are very stressful. And uh I think this is the right job for me, and I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, you know, try to, you know, continue to have some impact on the on the national DOE labs scene with through the chief research officers, and I think I can continue to do that for the next couple of years, and just hopefully be a mentor for people and hope, hopefully a role model if I can be for you know, female scientists because. One thing that I've been a little bit discouraged about, I would have to say, is the you know the low numbers, particular and 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 the research environment for young women scientists, which hasn't changed as much as I would have thought it would have changed in 40 years. I would have to say that, and I think that's probably more true in areas like uh, engineering and geophysics compared with something like, uh, you know, geology, geochemistry, geobiology, or, or some of the life sciences where we're much closer to parity in numbers, but we're still pretty low in, in so, some areas. And I think people are still facing some of the same, uh, the overt, overt discrimination types of things have largely abated, I believe, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, subtle stuff that still goes on. Marianne, this has been a terrific conversation. I'm so glad we were able to do this. I'd like to thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. It's always 
it's always fun to, to reminisce. And there are many other, I mean, 